to my delicious friend. Once again, the spectre of politics rears its ugly head in fair, fallen London. Once again, the people must choose a new mayor. Once again, the city will be divided by opinion, more so than usual. And once again, I am writing to you with my thoughts on those up for the election. I tend to leave the city during times of political upheaval, lest I get swallowed up in the frenzy of it all. That, and this year, I am not a fan of any of the three candidates. Yes, unlike the previous two years where I ended up choosing one candidate to support, rather enthusiastically, shall we say, this year I find myself adrift politically. I agree with some of what each of the candidates say, and yet I find myself unable to trust or support any of them over the other two. It seems my streak of backing the winning horse, as it were, will be coming to an end this year, by default if nothing else. But my lack of support for the candidates does not leave me without anything to say. I still have opinions on these candidates, opinions that may be dangerous to hold depending on who wins this year's contest. As I advised you last year, it is probably best you burn this letter once you have learned all you seek from it. The first of this year's candidates is the enigmatic Mr. Slowcake. His reputation and his assistants precede him, as at the time of writing, the man has yet to make any formal public appearance or a public appearance of any kind, for that matter, despite the widespread publicity of his campaign so far. And, on the surface, that campaign would be something I would throw myself behind in support. It seems that after years of recording The Exceptional of London, Mr. Slowcake has grown tired of wealth and class determining one's worth. He supposedly campaigns for equality of opportunity, where the content and worth of one's soul is the determining factor in one's value in the city. And therein lies the problem, the value and quality of one's soul. Mr. Slowcake is, more than likely, a plot implemented by our neighbours down the river, and it is unlikely that they are acting alone. After all, those with the most valuable souls tend to make for good protagonists in love stories, if you understand my... implication. This, combined with Mr. Slowcake's lack of public appearances and my own experiences with our neighbours down the river, makes it impossible for me to trust him. And if all he cares about is the worth of one's soul, where does that leave the 11% of the city bereft of such? Is it acceptable to create further social stratification in a city already steeped in it? No, Mr. Slowcake shall not be receiving my vote or my support. Second, there is the wife of the current mayor and the most visible member of the royal family, the captivating princess. Need I say more as to why I oppose her? Policies and her own character aside, royalty should no longer have any powers beyond the ceremonial in this nation. We had a civil war and suffered under the Puritan dictatorship of Oliver Cromwell to decide this fact. Royalty should remain a figurehead and be kept from even the limited powers of the mayoral office as the Masters will no doubt remain the true power of the city regardless of who wins. Then there are the dynastic implications that could arise from her victory given her marriage to the current mayor of the city, Verducci. Now, whilst I needn't oppose her politics, there is much about her campaign that I do oppose beyond its constitutional implications. She wishes to, in her own words, make London a city restored to its former magnificence, and yet, I would argue, London is a city of great magnificence as it is, already overflowing with delights for the soul, the mind, and more. Her campaign slogan, Make London Magnificent for Me, combined with her goal of making London a delight for the appetite, also worries me. I cannot say much without either of us attracting undue attention we'd do best to avoid, but to be discreet as possible, when people whisper that the princess is a man-eater, they rarely refer to her romantic involvements. I may have supported and continue to support figures of questionable morality in this city, but even I have lines that I will not cross. Finally, we have a candidate of whom I am fond of personally, but would not trust as far as I could throw, the jovial contrarian. Returning to the field of politics after his unsuccessful bid against Sinning Jenny two years ago, only this time around he is running on a platform that is, in every practical sense, the complete opposite of his positions from the aforementioned prior election. He now campaigns for authority, to pull ourselves together as it were, to end the chaos that runs rampant through the city. Admirable positions on the surface, I'm sure you'll agree, but considering what authority the contrarian has had previous associations with, Associations I doubt he has left completely behind, 
I doubt his form of authority is one that will benefit the city in the long run. If, on the other hand, he has truly changed his previous allegiances, I wonder what authority he now idolises and supports. I could be wrong, but I doubt his loyalty lies with the Masters or the Crown given his opponents. Could he have truly abandoned his principles and now serves judges of a far higher court who reside in a certain untamed wilderness, perhaps? Such words are dangerous, I know, and perhaps untrue, but I cannot help but feel a great unease at the Contrarian's new platform. I hope you see why then, delicious friend. I cannot, in good conscience, support any of this year's mayoral candidates. Though, I do implore you not to take my word as gospel. If you seek to support one of these three figures, don't let my words stop you. Instead, let them help you understand the position of a humble archivist. I don't know when I shall return to the city, though I doubt it will be before the end of the election at the earliest. Do stay safe, delicious friend. I would hate for harm to befall you. Yours sincerely, Professor Gabriel Roach, The Archivist.